Okay, so um, hi everyone, uh, welcome back. Um, this is the uh, second uh, seminar in the uh, new initiative of uh, the quarantine thermal sessions. I'm sure plenty of you guys out there are in self-isolation all over the world and um, are glad to, to listen to some, um, to some physics. Just before I, I introduce our esteemed speaker, just a couple of things. Um, obviously, we're, you know, the first, the first um, uh, seminar went really well. It got a very good response from the community. Um, we have now over 400 people subscribed on the mailing list. Um, so I'd like to keep that going. I'd like to try and keep up a regular set of speakers. We already have plenty of excellent volunteers, and I'll be keeping you updated over time. Um, one of the things that someone asked me about was, um, you know, about the time zones and all this type of thing. What I can say is that I don't think this thing really works unless I really leave flexibility for the speaker to choose the time that, they, um, that, they, that they're comfortable with. So I can't really tell someone they have to speak on Friday at 4 o'clock because we're in such a strange situation. Now I know myself with small kids in the house and I'm sure many other people there are like that, that you don't really have that sort of, you know, that sort of rigidity in your life anymore. So I can't really do that. Um, so listen, without um, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our second speaker, who I'm super excited uh, agreed to do this. Uh, it's Professor Juan Perando from uh, Madrid. So Juan is there in Madrid in lockdown. I see two guitars on the wall. Uh, we won't ask him at this point to give us a to give us a rendition of his, his, his favorite tune, but he's going to tell us about some physics. So Juan, if you just want to share your slides there, um, and I'll drop out. Okay, John, thank you very much. No problem. Bye. So thank you, and thank you, everybody. So if you can go to full screen mode as well. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So everything is fine now? Everything is perfect. Great. So thank you, John. Thank you for uh, organizing all of this and keeping physics alive in these uh, times. And thank you, everybody, for for attending the, the seminar. Um, okay, so I will talk today about the uh, irreversibility and dissipation, which is a, a kind of summary of work that I've done for, for the last uh, more than 10 years with many people that will appear on the, the seminar. Uh, but the main message of the... Is, I, I have to say all, all, also because this is a quantum thermodynamics or quantum physics uh, uh, seminar series that uh, all it's going to be classical almost uh, 20 percent sorry 90 percent but i hope that uh, many of the things that i'm going to tell can be extend uh, can be extended to quantum and there will be some there are now some interesting work on quantum mechanics uh, irreversibility in quantum thermodynamics okay so yeah uh, the the content of the talk can be summarized in this in this sentence that um what i will show you is that uh, this relationship between irreversibility and dissipation which is something that we learn in undergraduate courses of thermodynamics can be made quantitative so uh, we can have a quantitative measure of irreversibility and what it is more important we can uh, relate this quantitative measure to dissipation to the entropy production, work in biology, very important issues like ATP consumptions and so on. Um, to start, let me first uh, re recall what we, how we introduce irreversibility in in undergraduate courses. Usually, we we show movies like the one that you are seeing now, and uh, we 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 play the movie forward and backward in time. And uh, we stress, we, we, we realize that one of the two, sorry, one of the two uh, uh, possibilities is, is impossible in nature to see. For instance, it's impossible to see all the pieces of this broken glass to get together and, and rebuild the, the glass. In the, in the micro scale, in the microscopic world, things are not so easy. This is a simulation of a molecular motor in the cell, kinesine, and you see that uh, uh, everything is, is subjected to uh, thermal fluctuations. So what we see is, uh, is a lot of fluctuations and it's not so easy to, to observe uh, an arrow of time, to observe irreversibility. I have to say that if, if instead of just uh, seeing this uh, 
Oops, sorry, because instead of uh, just looking at at the the motion of this molecule, if we could see um, uh, more, uh, if we could have access to more information about the system, like for instance, if ATP is being consumed or not, then we could spot the 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 the, the real one. And what is the backward and what is the forward? For instance, uh, if we see ATP being degraded to ADP, uh, we immediately see that this is the real process. And it's very unlikely to see ADP converted into ATP um, by means of some uh, random fluctuations. So uh, from this uh, uh, first slide, we have two messages. The first thing is that in the microscopic world, the arrow of time is not so uh, evident as in the macroscopic world. And second, that um, if uh, uh, if we have hide information, if we he, hidden information, sorry, we have hidden information, then also the arrow of time is less uh, less uh, trivial. Okay, we will um, uh, these two things will be important in the in in the important uh, issues in the in the seminar. So this is a, a, a summary. I will I will show you first this quantitative measure of irreversibility. We will apply this to molecular motors, and at the end of the talk, I will tell you about the role of non-Markovianicity, which is very important, and finally some words about the arrow of time in quantum in quantum mechanics. But before starting, I, I also I, I I've collected. Uh, videos like this one, no, where you have two different uh, something play forward and backward. And in the last weeks, there were some videos in internet, but maybe you know this one. It's uh, 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 just uh, very macroscopic. So you see this video, and if I run the video backward, you will see something with, uh, at first sight, looks uh, a bit strange. Uh, as, I, as I've heard, this has been circulated through Twitter, so many people maybe know this. Uh, well, the, the, the funny thing, if you look at the second video, one, uh, the two videos are just one reverse the other. The real one is the one on the right. So this is the real one, and, uh, and this is the, the backward one. And uh, here you see that if I ask you the question, what, which one is forward and which one is backward, uh, you have two strategies. One is to look at the big picture. The big picture is to see uh, if if, uh, if if order or a disorder, uh, if if these uh, nails can be uh, uh, order or disorder, and. Um, the second strategy could be to see, to look at the, oops, sorry, to look at the, the small scale, not the big picture, but the small scale, like to try to spot some dissipation, maybe some uh, strange behavior in one of these of these uh, pieces of metal. Okay, so we have this. This has not really relationship with the. Uh, the the talk because we are going to study this problem but in the microscopic world okay so let me now uh, put uh, pose the same problem with a more artificial although it could be done in the lab which is a brownian particle in in, in a potential that will be changed as uh, you will see how it, it changes so we have the brownian particle in a box and we raise a barrier and we move the barrier to the left this is one of the of the of the. This is this is the movie. It's very simple. We do it quasi statically, because if we do it fast, you could maybe see some uh, some uh, reaction in the in the particle that reveals the arrow of time. Okay, this is one. This is the process, and and again we record the movie and we play forward and backward. This is the process or this is the backward process. I, you have to solve the same question as before. So let's play the video in the other direction. I will not tell you which one is forward and which one is backward. The question is, uh, or the problem is to, to, to answer this question, which one is forward and which one is backward. And uh, usually in my seminars, I, I, I give the audience a couple of minutes to think about it. And people uh, start to discuss which, which, 
which one could be forward and which one could be backward. If if the motion uh, of the of the potential is quasi static, you cannot see from the small picture. You cannot see from the motion of the of the ball. Uh, which one is forward and which one is backward. It's completely reversible. But there is an irreversibility here. Which one? The irreversibility is, let's say, as, as we uh, introduced before in the big picture, the, the irreversibility comes from the fact that here I raise the barrier in the middle, and here I raise the barrier, let's say, one third to the distance from the left wall. Okay? So, if I do this experiment, or if I if I do this uh, this thing, this uh, process uh, many times, I would see a difference between uh, these two. If suppose that these two processes are the real ones. In the first case, if this is the if if the one on the on the left is the real one, I would see the particle one half of the time on the left side and one half of the time on the right side. Whereas if the forward one is the one on the right, then I would see the ball on the left part one third of the time and on the right part two thirds of the time. So this is a, a, a funny irreversibility because it is, for instance, in one, just in one cycle, if I, if I show you the movie of just one cycle, it's not really, it's almost uh, it's very unlikely that you can say which one is forward and which one is backward. But if I do the experiment, if I do this process uh, 100 times, then if it is 40, 60 or 45, 55, you can immediately say that this is the, the real one. Whereas if, if you see the ball like three, 30 times, 70 times here, 30 times here, or something like that, then you can immediately, sorry, you can immediately say that this is the real one. So the irreversibility is revealed by the, these probabilities, but you need a number of cycles to really uh, uh, spot which one is the forward and which one is the backward. With just one cycle, it's not possible to see. This is why we call these weak arrows of time or probabilistic arrows of time. What it is more interesting is that this difference of probabilities in one process and in the reverse process is also related with the energetics, with the work. So we have this irreversibility here and it has a consequence on the work. We can calculate the work that we need to do to, uh, to uh, realize uh, all this process. We can use just the, 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 the equation of, of ideal gases and use PDB as the work. And it's easy to calculate uh, what is the work. For instance, if we go from, from, from left to right, you have two possibilities with probability one half and one half. In, in the first possibility, we have an expansion. This, has, this is related with the Sealer engine. If, if for people who knows about the Maxwell demon, so here we have an expansion, and the work is the, the the initial volume divided by the final volume. In this expansion, we extract work, we extract energy. Whereas if the particle is here, we compress and we have to do some work. Uh, so this is the work that we have done to complete the process from left to right. And you see what happens, what, what we have here, we have exactly the probabilities in the forward process and the probabilities in the backward process. So we can write the work necessary to uh, complete the, the, um, the process as a sum of the log of these ratios, probabilities of observing something in the forward process and probability of observing something in the backward process. The work, by the way, in this in, in this in this process, which is isothermal, is just the heat dissipated to the thermal bath, so it's the entropy production. So we have that the entropy production is given by this uh, this um, uh, formula, and people uh, uh, that know about uh, uh, information theory immediately recognize here something called the relative entropy or Kullback-Leiber divergence between forward and backward distributions. Uh, 
So here you see that this this is we will we will discuss this concept of, of relative entropy uh, later on. But you see that this is a measure of irreversibility. This is telling us how different is the forward distribution from the backward distribution, and this is quantitatively uh, related with the entropy production. So we have. This idea that we learn in thermodynamics that uh, irreversibility uh, uh, always implies some entropy production here is expressed in a quantitative way and also for these weak arrows of time where the arrow of time is not clear. So here we have, um, this is K, so this is of the order of the Boltzmann constant. Here we have a very tiny entropy production because the arrow of time is weak. You see in the macroscopic world, the, the entropy production is of order of the of of, of uh, joules divided by Kelvin. So it's it's um, it's uh, uh, twenty orders of magnitude bigger than the Boltzmann constant, and then we have a completely the, uh, irreversibility. But here we have this weak irreversibility, which involves entropy production of the order of the of the Boltzmann constant. Okay, another example where irreversibility is associated with entropy production is uh, when we have uh, uh, a master equation where we have rates of uh, transitions from a state with energy EI to another state with energy EJ. So you know that we have detailed balance, so the probability to jump up in the energy landscape divided by the probability to the reverse jump is given by this. So if you take the log of this uh, uh, expression, we have that this is the heat. That it is these jumps are uh, induced by some by 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 a thermal bath. So the the energy when when the system uh, goes up, it takes energy from the thermal bath. When the system goes down, it releases energy to the thermal bath. So we have that the heat is this difference of energy, and this is kT law of the ratio of the two probabilities. So the entropy production, which is nothing but the heat divided by the temperature, again is given by an expression like this. We immediately recognize here the log of something divided by, of some probability divided by the probability of the reversed uh, process. In this case, these processes are just jumps. So this is again the, rel the relative entropy between something that uh, occurs in the forward process and something that occurs in the backward process. Uh, the kullback library divergence for relative entropy is so important that uh, let me uh, a couple of minutes to discuss the properties. This is something that uh, is not, uh, it, it has been defined in, in information theory for any pair of probability distribution. So here we have P and Q. What example could be the probability distribution P induced by dice and the probability distribution Q in, induced by a lottery? And the kullback library divergence uh, 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 answered the, the, the following problem, which is like the basic problem in statistics. Suppose that you, uh, you have a, a source of random data, like dice or lottery, and uh, somebody in another room is taking numbers using one of the two methods, and you are given these numbers, 5, 7, 12, etc. The lottery, of course, has numbers from 2 to 12. Uh, so you are given these numbers and you have to guess which is the source. So if you have many numbers, then it's easy. You just uh, uh, make a histogram of the, of the data. And if the histogram is flat, you will, uh, you will guess that the source is given by the lottery. And the, if the histogram is like this one, the, you will uh, conclude that the, the source is the dice. This is the typical problem. Even, even with just only one number, only one datum, you could say uh, with a maximum likelihood uh, uh, procedure, you could even uh, decide which lottery and dice, but the probability of error is very big. So the, the, uh, the, the basic problem in statistics is first how to decide. We have a lot of uh, we have, um, uh, criteria like the maximum likelihood. And then what is the error that you get uh, when you decide, when uh, when you have to solve the problem, which is the the source of this data, okay. And
and the 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 Kulba climate divergence precisely answered this question uh, by something called the Stein's lemma, which tells that the probability of guessing p when the data are uh, q are distributed as q is given by the exponential of this Kulba climate divergence, and of course multiply by the number of data that you get. So this is uh, get tells you that. Uh, if D is very large, D, D, D is, a, is, a, is a measure of how different P and Q are. If D is very large, this error uh, decays very fast. So me, this means that it is, it is very easy to distinguish P from Q. But if D is very small, then you need a lot of data to distinguish P from Q. For instance, in the case of the, of the um, lottery and the dice, these are the kulbach leibler so you need approximately five data to distinguish with an error. Uh, sorry, this is wrong, with an error of 75. So, um, uh, so another important thing is that uh, you see that it is not symmetric. Uh, this is a bit technical, but it is because P is, 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 is more likely that P looks like Q than Q looks like P. It's a bit technical. This is a, a, a mathematical fact. This prevents the kulbach leibler divergence to be called a distance. Sometimes, sometimes people call this a, a, a kulbach leibler distance, but it is not really a distance in the sense that uh, it is not, it's not symmetric and it's not, uh, it's not, um, it doesn't fulfill the triangular uh, inequality, for instance. But it, it is a measure of the distinguishability. Uh, and it's a measure that has a, a very specific meaning, um, uh, as the Stein lemma uh, shows us. It's always positive, and it's zero only if p and q are equal. You see, if p and q are equal, the log of one is zero, and then you, we have that this is zero. Something also very important is the chain rule, that if I have two random variables and two dis probability distributions, um, the kullback leibler of the joint distributions is always bigger than the kullback leibler of the of the marginals. This is uh, this is very uh, uh, expected because uh, the kullback leibler is a measure of distinguishability. If I have less information here, I have more information about my system. Now I have x and y, and here I have less information. So the more information, the easier it is to distinguish uh, these two uh, distributions. This has been used a lot in quantum information as well. People know very well the relative entropy to, to uh, uh, for instance, to quantify entanglement. This has been used also uh, to, to uh, in many, in many situations, like for instance, to uh, classify authors in literature or, or in, in linguistics. So it's a lot of applications. When you apply this to uh, processes, to thermodynamic processes, and uh, you put here the probability of uh, something that happens in the forward process, and here something that happens in the backward process, then this is a measure of how indistinguishable are the forward and the backward process, okay? So this is a measure of irreversibility. This is a measure of irreversibility. And uh, then this is a measure of irreversibility, which is nice, but it is more important that we can really, uh, uh, um, uh, quant uh, in a quantitative way, relate this measure of irreversibility with the entropy production. And this is something that we did in 2009 with uh, Ryoichi Kawai and Chris Vandenbroek, who uh, sadly passed away last year. And um, uh, this is our main result, which you can find in this paper. And uh, what is here, the entropy production? Well, the entropy production could be many things, depending on the process, could be the heat, could be the work, could be in a process or per unit of time, could be the ATP consumption in a, in a cell, and, and um, depending on the situation. What is this uh, X here? Because I said that this is the feedback level of some distribution uh, in, Related with the forward process and some distribution related with the backward process. But what is uh, X? Well, X could be all many things. Could be an unobservable at a given time. Uh, different observables, uh, some macroscopic trajectory, which will be like a, in several observables in a, in a continuous time. It could be the work. It could be a microscopic state or it could be a microscopic trajectory. So with all these uh, uh, 
uh, if you put he, X, uh, one of those things, uh, the inequality is is uh, satisfied. So it's a very general result, but of course one has to ask, what about how tight is this inequality? And this is given by this list of things you see here. Uh, from top to bottom, it's you are adding more and more information. Here I have all the information. If, if, if the system is a classical system, for instance, a microscopic trajectory, well, actually a microscopic trajectory will have the same information. But if I go from bottom to top, I will lose information. And remember the chain rule. Uh, this means that the Kullback Leibler will be bigger and bigger if I go from bottom to top. So, sorry, from top to bottom. So this means that the inequality will be tighter if I use uh, several snapshots, tighter if I use a microscopic trajectory, tighter if I use the work, and so on and so on. Because I'm using more and more information, and this is this is bigger, and then the inequality will be tighter. You see that some uh, examples here are in red and some in, in, in green. Uh, this is because from here, to the bottom, so the green examples uh, um, uh, saturate the inequality. So if you just hear the work along the process, this will be an equality. Actually, this is just a consequence of the uh, celebrated Crookes theorem. So here we have inequality, and here we have equality. Of course, there is a lot of work on how tight is this inequality, and I will talk about this later on. The proof of this uh, is, is very easy. So you can see the details here, but the, the main idea is, uh, uh, for instance, if you would use a microscopic state at time t, uh, is to write this kullback leibler divergence, relative entropy. Remember that is p log the ratio, but we decompose the ratio in a, in a, in a, in a log of pf minus log of pv. And then we have here the Shannon entropy, minus the Shannon entropy. And here we have something called the cross Shannon entropy. But the important thing is that this is, if this is the forward process and this is the backward process, both uh, terms are invariant under time uh, evol under evolution. Mm, well, uh, if, this, if the system uh, has a, uh, is isolated. I will not give the details, but the idea is that the Shannon entropy is invariant under time, uh, under time. so the, uh, this is well known. And this is also, this is not so trivial, but this is also invariant. So we can shift this guy, oops, sorry. We can shift this guy to the initial time, we can shift this guy to the final time. This is the initial entropy production, and depending on how I choose the initial condition for the forward process, I can make this the, 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 the final entropy. So this shows that this is equal to this for a microscopic state, and then by using the chain rule, you can go, you can derive the inequality. This is the main, um, the main uh, idea. Okay, now I will show you uh, some application that we were uh, working on of, of the application of this to molecular models, which is important in, in biophysics. Um, and the, the idea came from uh, Fran Juliher when I, uh, when I presented this years ago. Uh, he proposed, why don't we, uh, what, is it not possible to apply this to sta stationary trajectories? Because uh, in a stationary trajectories, the forward and the backward process are essentially the same. There is no uh, driving that you have to, to, uh, to reverse in time. So we can take a, a, a trajectory. This is actually a trajectory that comes from some uh, uh, biophysical system. And then we can do the following. We can compare this trajectory with the backward trajectory. So we take the trajectory, we invert it in time, and we compare these two uh, by using, we could try to calculate the kullback library divergence of these two uh, examples. This is uh, something that uh, uh, was uh, the, the, the main topic of uh, Edgar Oldans. This is Edgar is now in ICTP and he's still working on, on dissipation in, in, and, and irreversibility. So this is the idea to, to, to calculate now the, the Kullback library or the, the relative entropy of these two stationary trajectories. How can we do it? Well, there is a brute force method, which is we have here a time series, and here we have the same time series but reverted in time. 
And the idea is to, to calculate the Kullback Leibler. Uh, when you have a stochastic process, you calculate the Kullback Leibler for finite uh, pieces of the process. So you look for uh, uh, the probability to observe some uh, sequence and the probability to observe the same sequence here, which is the probability to observe the, the, the reverse sequence, and you average this. And if you, if you, um, if you uh, increase the size of these sequences, you get uh, the entropy, you get the Kullback library of the two stationary stochastic processes. And then this is a bound to the uh, entropy production. Uh, I like very much this formula because in this formula uh, you see that uh, what it is on the in the in the left hand side is physics, is entropy production, is could be dissipated heat, work, ATP consumption, and many things related with the energetics of the process. So for instance, how many entropy is being produced here? If this is a, if this is a molecular motor, it could be uh, how much ATP how much ATP is being consumed. And what, look what we have here. What we have here is only the statistics of the data. So we don't have any, uh, we can guess the entropy production, the minimal entropy production to generate this data just looking at the data. Of course, there is a uh, Boltzmann constant here that uh, allows the change of uh, units. But essentially, but this is only the statistics of the data. Uh, this is a little bit uh, an extension of Landauer's principle. If you think of Landauer's principle, that uh, uh, Landauer's principle tells you that there is a minimal, uh, in not, not entropy production, but dissipation in this case, uh, to get some behaviors. This is a bit uh, like that. Okay, so we applied this to um, uh, to some examples, first to toy examples, and now we are trying to do it to real data in experiments. Uh, this is brute force and it's very hard to uh, do it. But before going to the examples, just uh, let me uh, tell you something that although this is a very nice uh, uh, expression uh, relating statistics, data statistics with uh, physics, it's something that for Markovian processes is something that it is not really new. For Markovian processes, these probabilities are just, uh, uh, they factorize. So uh, this formula reduces to this one which is known since, I mean, since the 30s of the last century. So it is uh, that the entropy production is given by a current times uh, an affinity. And this is uh, an affinity that, uh, mm. so it is, it is not something new. And uh, it, it has also something which will be important now that, uh, in the, in, that this, although it is well known that the entropy production in a, in a system it's current times some affinity. Uh, it means that if there are no currents, then the entropy production is zero. So, and, it's, and for a Markovian system, this our our estimation, which is also this this uh, kullback leibler divergence estimation, is will be zero. Okay. So keep in mind these two things. Now we are going to apply this to molecular motors. Molecular motors are very important in the in 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 biophysics. You, you have. Uh, uh, kinase in this uh, many molecules in the in the cell. This is an experiment of myosin acting, and one of the one of the problems of um, molecular motors. Uh, sorry, this is this is also some uh, how we model these molecular motors. We can model this with uh, Markov chains. Uh, this is, for instance, a model that uh, I will. Uh, um, using the uh, later on, which is um, you have uh, uh, the spatial coordinates and some internal state. And usually uh, molecular motors like this one are modeled by, by Markov chains where the molecule can have two states. And some of the transitions, this is the important thing, some of the transitions are biased by ADP and by the consumption of ATP. And this is another uh, another uh, example of molecular motor. This is based. Uh, we will use this later on. This is based, although the details are not really important for for the talk. But uh, 
This is based on, on a, a, a Brownian particles that move in a potential that is switched on and off alternatively, and they exhibit this motion in one direction. This is called the flashing ratchet. And sometimes the flashing ratchet is more like that, like a Markov chain. This is a Markov chain where this is the position of the motor and this is the internal state of the motor. So the, the motor can change the internal state and can move also in one direction. We will apply the, uh, as I said before, we, are we, we, we apply this uh, irreversibility and dissipation uh, result to toy models, and this is one of the first toy models that we apply to. Okay, so uh, 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 one of the problems with these molecular motors is whether they are active or passive. So they are uh, just uh, when you see this movie, as you see the, the one that I uh, showed at the beginning, whether this behavior is just a thermal fluctuation or there are really uh, ATP being consumed and uh, uh, if there is an entry production, if the, if the motor, if there are a motor here really working. This is a I use this cartoon where you have you are uh, hiking in a forest and then you see uh, you see the situation and if you go uh, closer you get closer you see that the motor even though the car is stopped you, you see that the motor is running so this is the problem that many biophysicists face that uh, they see some fluctuations in the, in this case and the problem is whether there is an entropy production they of course they don't see any current so uh, uh, the the typical methods which use the current of uh, uh, of particles for instance or the velocity of the motor they fail to to uh, uh, to answer this question so um uh, we can apply this to our to our system and well this is just uh, uh we can apply our, our ideas to this type of systems and this is what we did with the flashing ratchet this is a this is an example of brownian motor i i explained very briefly how it works it's a mark of chain so the system is jumping uh, between these two states. Sometimes it, this is the spatial coordinate. So the motor can move or can change state, switch the state, and here it can move as well. Here the potential is flat, here the potential is a budget potential. So we have a motion in one direction. Um, and uh, and uh, the idea is that we can also apply a force against this motion at some point there will be something called the stall force where the system just uh, stop it stops it doesn't move but still we have fluctuations now suppose that i am a biophysicist in the lab and i only have access to the position of the motor i can see where uh, how the motor moves so at the stall force i would see uh, just my motor uh, making a kind of random walk which is uh, in principle which with, with no uh, net motion in one direction. So I would see some fluctuations and the problem is uh, from that fluctuations, can I guess what is the entropy production? If I apply the typical, uh, um, um, the typical expressions for entropy production, the current is zero, the, mo the motor is not moving, there is no motion in the motor, so I will get a zero zero entropy production but here using our methods we can take advantage of the fact that the the position of the motor the motion the spatial motion of the motor is not markovian so i can use this expression using words which are of size three of size four up to nine and i can exploit the fact that the system is not markovian and do find and entropy production. So this is the entropy production that we find with our with our expressions, with this expression. And it's something that you cannot get just by using current, because the current in this case is zero. So we have a motor that it doesn't it is not moving in any direction, but we can uh, by studying the fluctuations, we can uh, uh, guess we can first uh, detect that it is dissipating entropy and second 
we can even bound this, this sensory production. Uh, the bound is not very good, but uh, you see that we can see that there is a still produ producing entropy. This is this black curve is the actual entropy production, and this is our estimations using this formula here. Okay, this is uh, nice, but uh, of course this is very hard to do. This is we we first did it in a toy model like this one. Here we have only one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, when, when we only have access to the position, we have only three states. And with three states, you can easily calculate this in using brute force, using just calculating histograms uh, uh, for up to nine uh, words of size, uh, substrings of size nine. But what happened in the system is, is continuous. Well, I will not get, uh, go into details. You have the details here in this paper, but we have also techniques to use uh, to calculate the Kullback library divergence for non-Markovian processes that are continuous, even in, uh, continuous in space. In time, we have do always have time series with some uh, some finite sampling frequency, but uh, uh, this this is uh, uh, good for continuous non-Markovian processes. The idea is to transform your process into something which is white noise. This is called whitening transformation. In, in in time series analysis, and once you have a white noise, it's much easier to calculate the the um, the Kullback library divergence or the relative entropy. Okay, but I want to finish with a couple of things. First, uh, uh, something related also with non-Markovian density, and it's something that I've done with uh, uh, Jordan Horowitz, Gilly Bisker, and Iñaki Martinez. Um, and, and the idea is the following. Uh, uh, the, it's, it's illustrated with a very simple example. Again, we are trying to calculate Kullback library divergence of stochastic processes. But this is, and, and, and here we have a, sp a special stochastic process, but it, it, is, it, is some, it is a stochastic process that it is very uh, common to find in, 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 in biophysics. You will see why in a moment. And the idea is that I have a motor again. So the motor, this is position. So the motor can go up and down. And it has a probability one have to go up and probability one have to go down. Okay. But time is continuous. And whenever it goes down, it takes two seconds before the jump. And whenever it goes up, it takes one second. Okay. So although here the net motion is zero, of course we have irreversibility and it's immediately you see the irreversibility if you look at the at this trajectory from uh, right to left you will see that before jumping up you have two seconds and before jumping down you have two seconds exactly the opposite so this is highly irreversible and the irreversibility is not revealed by the probabilities it's revealed by the transition the time the waiting time distributions. This is called the waiting time distribution. How how long you wait until the next uh, jump, and uh, uh, these transition times or waiting times, uh, they are the basic uh, um, idea behind something called semi-Markov chains, or in physics they are also known as continuous time random walk. You you know that you have a Markov chain, so you have jumps from one state to the other. Semi-Markov chains are uh, processes where the, the the jumps are Markovian, but the time the waiting time distributions are not uh, are non, non Markovian. So you have a, a probability, for instance, to jump from one to two. This is the probability that the system jumps to a state two if it arrives at the state one at time zero. So you have uh, the, your your process is 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 determined by these probability distributions, and it turns out that if the process, the whole thing is Markovian, this is or this is Markovian only if these distributions are exponentials, or the jumps are Poissonian events, if you like. Uh, but you can have other distributions, like for instance, uh, uh, you can have a delta, which is, uh, well, in a, in a delta is also Markovian because it's waiting, but you can have a Gaussian here, 
like in a clock, no, that goes uh, more or less uh, with some precision. It jumps like um, from one state to another state in almost deterministic times. So whenever you this departs from exponential, you have uh, something which is non-Markovian, and it's called semi-Markov. It's semi-Markov because the state trajectories are still Markovian, but the transition time distributions are not are not exponential. Okay, so our our previous example, this one is this case. You have uh, you have the no Markovianicity comes from the uh, waiting time distributions. So we apply our our uh, technique to this uh, to these processes, and we found this uh, expression that uh, the relative entropy between two semi Markov chains is given by something which is essentially. The, the the Markovian part is the probability to jump from I to J, probability to jump from J to I. It depends only on the states, but it vanishes if the current is zero. So this is again uh, a, a current times affinity. But we found other more interesting uh, term, which is given by the asymmetry, the asymmetry of the waiting time distributions, and this can be different from zero even in the absence of currents. Okay, so uh, I, we apply this to to uh, molecular motors, like motors where the, the the motor jumps in one direction. This is position, but has a, um, in active matter, uh, um, in 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 other systems. And um, I will finish just because we are in this uh, series of uh, uh, quantum... Juan, sorry, can I interrupt you for a second? Uh, the people have had some uh, connectivity issue. Let me just let me just see if you can backtrack on that slide and see if I can reconnect. Okay. 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 So 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 can you can you maybe go back and um, and just explain this slide again because I think it works now again. Okay. Which one? Uh, start from so, so so let me just ask uh, uh, I think the previous slide maybe sorry about this but it probably had a had a instability in the connection um, so maybe we can yeah start start from there and 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 redo it if you don't mind I'm sorry you can you can you can okay. go yeah from there from okay. there is perfect great yeah uh, this this slide was just to show you that the, the semi Markov processes are ubiquitous in, in whenever you have a Markov chain like this one, this is a motor again, a model of a motor. So you have position of the motor and some internal states. And now suppose that in the experiment, you only have access to the position. So you only know this, uh, where is the, the motor, okay? When, when, uh, there, when you eliminate the internal states, eliminate, you, you, you put it in a, a single state, so you make some kind of decimation here of the states. The resulting uh, the resulting uh, stochastic process is semi-Markov. So whenever you have a Markov process, if you eliminate for some topologies of the Markov process, if you eliminate the states or or you merge states in a single one like here, uh, then the result is a semi-Markov process. So this is uh, why uh, we can apply. Uh, this is several um, cases. This is again a, 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 not. This is not a toy model because this is a model that people uses a lot for molecular motors, but uh, it's it's uh, the, it's not experimental data. So we we can compute the kullback leibler divergence of forward and backward, and you see that even in the stall force, when the the, the green one is the the prediction of the classical current times affinity expression and then we can still in the stall force when the motor is not moving in average uh, so it, it has only fluctuations but it is not moving it, it is not moving in any direction so we can still uh, detect that the system is out of equilibrium uh, this is an example for instance when when the, the the waiting time distributions are very different in one direction than in the other especially like in the when i introduce the the this uh, topic this very simple example okay so i was just mentioning that uh, there are yeah yes yeah i'm here Okay, okay, no, I thought you were saying something. No. Okay, so this is just a, a, an account of uh, other literature on the problem that uh, there are uh, ways of, of, of detecting out of equilibrium nests 
in systems by using fluctuation dissipation relations. There are also people trying to uh, to see irreversibilities in in, in mesoscopic uh, uh, systems like in active matter. Uh, but it is more interesting, uh, more related with what we have done. The work by Edgar Roldan with Frank Lefer and Isaac Neri on on uh, arrows of time using. Mm, using martingales and using decision making. This is also very, uh, very nice work, uh, which now they they extend it to to quantum systems with uh, Saro Fazio. So this is uh, uh, related with our problems. Just to finish uh, two minutes, just to say that what what we have in, in, in quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, there are also a, a number of papers and results on arrow of time. We have this by uh, Eric Lutz and, and Gabriel is here and, um, and Roberto Serra on, on reversing the direction of heat flow. This is not really, uh, uh, although in some media they showed that it was a re reversal of arrow of time. This is, uh, um, but, but they could reverse the, the heat flow. And uh, there is another interesting paper in the last uh, months on the um, arrow of time. Uh, which uh, uh, there is something in quantum mechanics. We are also tr now working with Gonzalo Manzano and Chasla Bruckner on on trying to apply these ideas, this expression to quantum systems, quantum processes. And uh, there is a, an extra problem, which is that here I showed just the probability of of uh, some of a forward process and a backward process. But one has also to apply the time reversal operator. In quantum, well, in classical mechanics, the time reversal operator is very simple. It's just to change the sign of, of velocities. But in quantum mechanics, the quantum... The time uh, Juan, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but do you, would you mind going back? Uh, is, it, is, it, is it back up now? Hold on, let me just, let me just see. Sorry. Um, I think it's working again. I, you know, is it working? It, I know it's choppy there. Sorry, I mean... Uh, Uh, well, it's almost spinning. This was just uh, okay. Uh, okay, it's okay for it's okay for them. It's okay for them. Sorry about this. It's some technical issues at the end. It must be the connection or something. But but continue on what you were saying. Sorry. Well, I was just saying that in, in quantum mechanics there is uh, an extra problem which probably makes things more interesting, which is the time reversal operator. So it is not so easy to uh, to implement the time reversal operator in quantum mechanics, and there is this paper, very recent paper, on that uh, uh, on that issue. So yeah, let's uh, finish with the conclusions. Uh, I show you this the, the, how the time reversal asymmetry is given entropy production, how one can use the relative entropy uh, to measure this uh, reversal symmetry, the important. Um, uh, 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 role of non-Markovianicity, and uh, I want to finish just with something uh, to, to put this question in a more uh, broad uh, context. And uh, as, as, as um, what I try to show you is that um, if you want irreversibility, you need to dissipate energy. So if if you want some behavior, there is a minimal dissipation, a minimal work that you have to do to get this behavior. So we have seen this behavior, we have we have studied the irreversibility, but we can study other type of behaviors that we want to do. For instance, if we want a clock, what is the minimal dissipation of a clock or a clock? This is something that uh, people like Marcus Hoover and more people is, is, is doing very nice work and, and it's related with the with with what Gabriel told us last week, this work by Barato Cipher on on the um, on the uncertainty relations. So uh, to finish the talk and connect it with the the talk of Gabriel last week, uh, I maybe to this formula that we derive on we have here the entropy production given because you have currents. Here, given because you have some irreversibility in the waiting time distribution, maybe there is also some term when you want a specific waiting time distribution, like in a clock where you want a specific waiting time distribution. So, uh, if uh, this is, I want to finish with this uh, uh, just a question. And thank you, everybody, for listening.
Thank you very much, uh, Juan. That was a fantastic uh, talk. Um, just to uh, just to tell people, uh, let me come into the conversation. Okay. Um, so can we? Uh, it's it's after hanging up. I mean, I'm having a little bit of problems with the connectivity one. I think that could possibly be on my side. So it's coming and going, but I think. Um, I think more or less everybody has got the um, has got the gist here. Um, um, but uh, do I do I have any other questions there from the from the audience? Because if I don't, I have one myself. Um, so so maybe maybe I can ask. Um, so I found this really fascinating. This idea that you can kind of define um, entropy production in the absence of of, of currents. Um, and what I was wondering is, you know, I mean, obviously you could apply this type of, um, you know, type of methodology to a, um, to something like a, you know, in cavity QED, where you look at measurement statistics coming from a detector um, with an atom in a cavity. And I was wondering if anybody has tried to kind of exploit um, this sort of machinery for analyzing kind of quantum non-Markovian processes. Uh, no, this is a great question, and this is why also I wanted to tell this here because I think um, we we found that in classical systems non-Markovianicity is very important to detect this. Uh, my question, one important question, is whether this is also the case in in non-Markovian open quantum systems. This yeah. is of course a great question. Yeah, I mean, definitely, but, but it's. In, I, but I don't have. I don't have any idea. So. It should be. It should be. It should inspire maybe people in the in the community that are listening in today that work on open systems. Maybe you know to to take a look into that. Um, so I have just one. I have another another question um, from uh, Somon Pal. So how much do things change if we introduce some kind of correlations, uh, classical or quantum, in the fluctuation relations? He means. Um, Correlations of what? Of uh, you know, I mean, I think it's a general question. I'm not sure if it.